Hey everybody, what's going on? And welcome to Rock and Roll True Stories. And I want to talk about a new story that kind of fell under the radar pretty recently. So it's been reported over a number of years. Um, the story about the early days of Velvet Revolver before Scott Weiland joined. But Buck Cherry frontman Josh Todd recently talked about some of the early days and why he's kind of still angry at Slash. So he was interviewed by the Appetite for Distortion podcast, which is a Guns N' Roses fan podcast. And he was talking about what was going on in 2002. Back then, he and uh, his guitarist, Keith Nelson, were invited by Slash to uh, write some songs with Duff, Slash, and Matt Sorum, formerly of Guns N' Roses at that time, for a charity performance in Los Angeles. And he said everybody was talking it, about it in L.A. after we did it. And he said there was this buzz going on. And Keith and I got back to the rehearsal room a few days later. I was like, man, that felt so good. It felt like Buck Cherry, but with really great players. And he goes, yeah, I totally feel the same way. It was so nice to be in a band because he we had been bandless for probably a month at that point or maybe longer. Now, he would recall that Slash was thinking the same thing. So we called him, hey, man, do you guys want to maybe write some songs and put together a band? He was into it. So we became a band for like a month. We were in the rehearsal room writing songs. And we even got to the point where we were taking management meetings to find a manager to manage us. And we were trying to come up with band names and all of it. And then things changed pretty quickly, Todd would say. All of a sudden, Slash came in and said he didn't want to do it. He pulled the plug without even letting us anybody, without letting us know or anybody know, and that really kind of set me off. I didn't like that. I didn't like wasting my time and spinning my wheels and somebody kind of leading me on. I don't even care who it is, whether it was Joe Blow or Slash. It really irritated me, but it was what it is. Now, Todd would reflect that it was a win-win situation, saying, it's like everybody was meant to be, but at that time it was frustrating. He was asked why Slash had decided to end the project, to which Todd said he didn't know why. He said, I think he had a different singer in mind, honestly, and what can you do about that? It is what it is, but it all worked out, so that's all that matters. Now, one thing that was missing from this discussion was that years later, Velvet Revolver, I think in 2008, would be sued by a band over their song Dirty Little Thing, which was released on their debut album Contraband in 2004, because apparently the riff had been lifted from another, like, um, it was a band uh, that wasn't really well known, but it happened that the riff and the song actually came from Josh Todd and Keith Nelson when they were rehearsing with Slash and the guys from Velvet Revolver. It was during an interview that Slash gave earlier this year with Nikki Six on his show Six Sense. Now in that interview, Slash didn't specifically say Dirty Little Thing. He just said Velvet Revolver got sued over an unnamed song by an unknown band called Dirty Deeds who claimed the supergroup's song sounded similar to their song Cyber Babe. So Slash said the following, before Velvet Revolver really became Velvet Revolver, we had written these two parts of one song, Duff and Matt and I, and then we were working with some other guys who will remain nameless, who brought it in, who brought in the other two parts of the song. So when Velvet Revolver came together, we kept the song as it was. He go on to say, and it turned out it was the other two guys had lifted their parts from a band they were rehearsing next door to. So that band heard the song and said, those are our riffs. Slash would go on to say, we didn't know what they were talking about, and then we heard who it was, and that there was a band who was rehearsing next door. So when we heard the record and the song, I heard where those parts were and I was like, oh. So according to Blabbermouth, the lawsuit was settled in 2008 with a 20% of the song's royalties being awarded to Tony Newton, who wrote the song Cyber Babe. And Tony Newton himself discussed the lawsuit saying it was all a bit surreal, really. A couple of years back, a mate of mine in LA called me to say he'd heard what he thought was my song on the radio and that he had been a bit shocked when he realized it was Velvet Revolver. And when I checked it out myself, I genuinely couldn't believe it because it wasn't as if it was close. It was basically the same riff. Anyways, I called my publishers to check whether they knew anything, which of course they didn't. And they basically left it, I basically left it with them. And I never really expected to hear anything more about it and was surprised anyone when I heard Universal had settled with Velvet Revolver. Turning out some other Guns N' Roses related news, so it was announced this week on basically out of nowhere that Guns N' Roses will be playing at least one U.S. tour date this coming year. Uh, they will be playing their first 2020 concert for Super Bowl week, and it's going to be part of the Bud Light Super Bowl Music Festival. So Guns N' Roses will play the second night of the festival. DJ Khaled and DaBaby will perform first with Maroon 5, who said at this year's Super Bowl halftime show was heavily criticized, taking the stage for the third night. So GNR revealed the news on Twitter, adding that tickets would go on sale to the public on December 9th. They also sent out an email to the members of their crappy Night Train fan club that they noted that they have access to pre-sale beginning uh, earlier this week at noon. And finally, we had it revealed uh, pretty recently, although it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, Metallica and Guns N' Roses were among the top earning musicians of 2019, according to Forbes. 
And keep in mind, Guns N' Roses did not tour a lot this year. They did a small fall tour. One of the shows I attended, which I'm still trying to get a video diary up on my site, on my uh, YouTube channel. So Guns N' Roses came in at number 25 with 2019 earnings of 44 million, while Metallica earned $68.5 million, landing at the number 10 spot. So to determine the rankings, Forbes looks at income from touring, the music, and outside business ventures with the help of pole star Nielsen Music and interviews with industry insiders, and including it includes many of the music stars themselves. So Forbes list measures pre-tax earnings and does not d- deduct fees for agents, managers, or lawyers. So when you see those numbers, they're not being split up three ways by the band members. There's a lot of overhead that they have to cover. That concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. And tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, where we'll have another Rock and Roll True Story episode for you. Take care.